morning, everyone. Morning. Steve, would you take the roll for the investment committee? Of course. Good morning. Um, Controller Yi. Here. Uh, Treasurer Ma. Here. Uh, Ms. Higa. Here. Ms. Yamamoto. Here. Ms. Dillon. Here. Ms. Hendricks. Here. Ms. Vargas. Here. For the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Yamanaka. Here. And for the Director of Finance, Ms. Lee. Here. Uh, Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, sir. Item one on the agenda is the approval of the committee agenda and work plan. I'd entertain a motion to adopt with flexibility. So moved. Second. It's been moved and properly second without objection. The work plan, the agenda for the day has been adopted. Mm -hmm. Item two is the um, approval of the minutes from January 30th, 2019. Any amendments? If not, I'd entertain a mo mo motion to approve. So Moved and properly second without objection. The minutes have been approved. Uh, communicated with uh, the team that item uh, eight is what we will go to next, which is the uh, green initiative report by uh, Brian Rice and Travis Antonio. Morning, Brian. Uh, for the purposes of uh, running the meeting today, we have numerous presentations throughout the day. And if it's okay with the committee, what I'm going to propose is that we receive staff's reports or consultant reports with the presentations and that our questions and conversations with them would be at the end of their reports rather than throughout the report. So please make note to yourself uh, if you have a question the page number or slide number so that you can reference it at the end of the uh, presentation. Okay. Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. This is a, a report that didn't get appropriate airtime last year. Joy and I thought it was important that we start our day with this uh, excellent report that you and the team have worked on throughout the year and years, the Green Initiative Report. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am Brian Rice. I'm a portfolio manager in the Sustainable Investment and Stewardship Strategies Group, formerly known as Corporate Governance. Uh, as Mr. Keeley pointed out, I am here today to present uh, the Green Team, the CalSTRS Green Initiative Task Force uh, most recent report. This report covers uh, our efforts uh, from fiscal year 2017-2018. Um, considering the new members on the board, I thought it might be helpful to provide a little bit of a, a background or history around the green team and, and the report. Uh, I think you have to go back to 2004, 2005, and that's back when the CalSTRS Teachers Retirement Board was really looking at climate change and its potential impacts to the investment portfolio and what we could do to manage those impacts. Um, they, at that time, they directed staff to develop a program around climate change, again, uh, investment opportunities and, and risk management. Some of the things that grew out of that was specifically look, asking private equity to look at clean or green energy uh, technology investment, uh, real estate to start looking at building energy efficiency, and the corporate governance group to start uh, engaging companies around climate change risks and how that might impact uh, their operations and through that, our investment portfolio. Um, you know, staff, we, we, we realized we needed a process to, to manage, uh, measure, report on our progress towards the objectives that, that the board had set for us. Uh, we felt that a team approach was the best way to do that, um, bring the asset classes together, work collaboratively, share experiences, best practices, successes, failures. Uh, and, and through that, the green team was formed. This was about 2006, I believe. And we began learning, collaborating, investing, and reporting. Um, so some comparing and contrasting uh, then to now, I think certainly the, the mission and objective of the team is still the same. Uh, realization that, that there could be adverse impacts. Investments can have adverse impacts on the environment. Uh, we need to be managing those risks. Conversely, uh, investments can have a benefit to the environment and we should be in a position to take advantages of, of those investments uh, when appropriate. Um, I think the team structure is pretty much the same. We're just a bit bigger now. Uh, in the beginning, we had one asset class representative on, on the team. Now we have two asset class representatives on the team, and we have more asset classes, so naturally the team has grown. Um, issues that we consider have certainly expanded. You know, it's, it's a much broader focus than climate change, though a lot of what we do is, is comes out of the climate change risk, so water and, and waste management is examples of issues. The reporting, 
certainly has evolved. I, I think back to one of the earlier versions uh, presenting that to someone and, and asking for their opinion and being told that it was great content, but it just looks like a Word document you passed around, which we had. So of course we we you know upgraded uh, to where now I think we have a very you know polished professional publication, and and, and the reporting to whom we report has certainly evolved. This was originally was a way to report to you the board progress on on the objectives you gave us, but it's really grown to we have a much wider audience now. And so this report certainly wants to target them and let them know what it is we're doing. Uh, we do have quite a few team members here. They're in the back. I'd like them to stand up now. So this is the Calsters Green team. As I said, uh, each asset class is represented. And you if you should have some questions specific to an asset class, they're here prepared to address those. Uh, one other thing I want to point out, I want to thank our communications group here at CalSTRS. This is all in-house publication, and specifically Renee Everts uh, for her help with this, for once again turning our content, uh, we think, into a very beautiful report. Uh, this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Travis. We'll take you through a quick a presentation on this year's report. Thank you. And can I jump in real quick, guys? Just the one thing I want to add, because I think it's really important to note compared to other pension plans, particularly our global peers. You guys see Brian and Travis as kind of the face, but that team you saw stand up, I really want to emphasize they're the point people, but they have a team behind them. And frequently when I, Jack and I see the European funds or the Australian funds, they'll have one person or maybe two that's in charge of this initiative. We decided that wasn't a very effective way, in my opinion, and so that's why we went with a team approach. So that really is a large group of people because I want you to know that it's actually integrated into every single asset class. So it's not just a side group that works on this. These two gentlemen do an awesome job of leading the effort, and, but it is a team approach and it's comprehensive in what we do. So Travis, take it over. opportunity for us to be able to highlight some of the different initiatives that we've been working on during this last year. As Chris mentioned, not only us, Brian, myself, but a large team uh, behind us. So this morning, first, uh, I'm Travis Antonio, an investment officer. I work with Brian and the CIS, formerly known as Corporate Governance Group. But this morning, uh, we're going to be highlighting a few of the different initiatives that we've been working on and uh, some key takeaways on in the report itself and how these link back to the initiatives. To really start it off, we're gonna be concentrating on the education initiative. And education is not only on education for risk management, but it's also on the different investment opportunities that do exist out there. And being able to bring in very high expertise individuals outside of this organization to provide us internal staff the education that we need to better do our jobs. Some of the examples that you can see are going to be on the left side, the guest speakers. Uh, Colin from Bloomberg New Energy Finance was able to come in and speak about future mobility. This was everything from EVs, electric vehicles, as well as batteries, and then also the future mobility in a sense of Lyft, Uber, and alternative forms of transportation and how that's going to be affecting the more broader transportation industry. And then Sushant, California ISO, Essentially, ISO oversees a bit of the utilities across California as far as the grid, the energy markets as well. And that's really what Sushant was able to focus on is being able to provide a little bit more of an education on exactly some of the threats or risk and opportunities around electricity, around power generation, and around di distribution itself. Some of the things that he also focused on were the broad energy markets and how policy is going to potentially affect energy markets going forward, not only tomorrow, but really over the next 10, 20, 50 year time period and how that aligns to some of the California climate policy goals as well. Outside of guest speakers, we also do have an opportunity as a staff to be able to attend a lot of significant events. Some of these events you may recognize such as PRI or, or series, but beyond those events, we do have the opportunity to attend and and be able to learn more from some of our peers out there, but then also, once again, from some of these niche uh, experts that uh, can really find out what that, that knowledge gap is and be able to satisfy and, and, and uh, bridge that. So outside of uh, education, 
And, and I know some of you have seen this before. And before I dive right on into it, I want to highlight the fact that we do bring in these guest speakers, as I already mentioned, and they do try to tackle innovation and adoption. And it's not just tackling innovation and adoption in and of itself, but it's really being able to understand how innovation and adoption going forward is going to affect both the consumer uh, and consumer's behavior and also the general market. What I want to do is focus your attention over on the left uh, left hand side. And so this is Easter morning, the year 1900, Fifth Avenue, New York City. And in that red circle, I know it's hard for some people in the audience, but in that red circle, you're able to see an automobile. Just one automobile. The rest is going to be surrounded by horses. And then on the right side, just 13 years later, you're going to be able to see a street, same exact street, flooded with vehicles. Now, this is only a 13-year period, but what it does show is the fact that innovation does sometimes take a little bit of time, but once it spins up, also known as once it surpasses the, the chasm, which is basically the phase of early adopters to the early majority, you can see some very rapid expansion in adoption. And this picture just really captures that, uh, that type of adoption in a very short period of time. Moving forward on to the second initiative, which is focused on integration of environmental risk factors. Some of these might be uh, familiar to last year's presentation, but we have added a, an additional risk, a risk factor. And a couple years back, when Brian and I were trying to focus on working with different audiences to have a better understanding of how, how we can better serve them in utilizing this report, one thing that was clear that we heard was that they wanted to be able to have a better understanding of how we use in different risk factor methods to be able to have a better understanding and incorporate these things in the investment management process. So a lot of our peers have more of an implicit type of understanding or, or disclosure around how they incorporate environmental risk. What we wanted to do is change that and shift that implicit disclosure more to an explicit disclosure. And so as a green team, we over several months, we developed more of a framework to summarize the different actions in which we take uh, into these 11 icons. And in the green team report itself, you're going to be able to see the different asset classes and where each of these individual efforts are more <coughs> prominent to specific asset classes uh, compared to others. Our third initiative, uh, which is really focused around uh, increasing allocations and increasing the ability to invest in more sustainable or green investments. One thing that's been really great about uh, uh, corporate what was formerly known as corporate governance, now CIS, is on the sustainable portfolio, uh, which you can see on the left-hand side, is that it's been acting a little bit as an incubation for sustainable inv investments, and specifically for the non-US sustainable portfolio. Uh, over time, we've been able to document and showcase that incorporating ESG risk factors as well as sustainable themes directly into the investment management process <coughs> can actually provide alpha. Uh, this chart over the last 10 years shows about a 1.5% uh, outperformance annualized. But what's not shown on the chart <laughs> is that over the one, three, and five year period, the outperformance has actually been significantly more. Uh, we have confidence in this portfolio, and going forward, I think uh, we hope to see this continued outperformance being showcased. On the right hand side is a chart from Inflation Sensitive Asset Class, and it shows $364 million that has been allocated to renewable or energy management related investments. I show this because it is you know, a very something that we should be proud of, but also I show this because there's so many other things that Caltrus is doing that aren't necessarily recognized because it's not necessarily a direct investment. <clears throat> this $364 million is just a, a small slice of the bigger pie of our total exposure into the energy management or into renewables. In fact, something to really showcase this is uh, Deloitte Energy Management recently re uh, released a report and it showed that about 94% of businesses out there provide some type of budget on an annual basis around energy management. And energy management is a little bit of a broad, broad focus, but it incorporates renewables as well. 
Now, I have these companies that do dedicate some type of budget to renewable assets or to energy management. The amazing part, and I had to read this twice, the amazing part is that these funds that are dedicated to this budget represent about 22% of each of the company's total capital budget. Uh, you might say, okay, 22% of the budget, okay, what does that actually mean? Now, to put that into, do into dollars, the S&P 500 uh, capital expenditures were about $700 billion last year. So if you take 22% of that $700 billion, you get a figure of about $150 billion that were dedicated towards energy management. That just showcases how significant this field is as far as energy management, as far as renewable activi activities and exposure that CalSTRS truly has above and beyond what we currently see up in the chart in front of us. It's an expansion that's continually growing in the amount of uh, resources that are being dedicated on the corporate side to energy efficiency, energy management, and renewables is astonishing. And it's really a force that is, is not gonna be stopped. It's only gonna continue to grow, which is great to see. We've highlighted some of the activities that we've already done, how they relate to the initiatives, but going forward, the green team report is gonna to have to change a little bit. And specifically, this, has, and this is related to the SB 964. Uh, this was a piece of legislation that was passed you know, in late 2018. And this bill requires us as CalSTRS to further report on climate-related financial risk of our public market portfolio every three years. And I say the words further report because CalSTRS already does a pretty significant job being able to disclose and being transparent in how we integrate environmental risk factors, some of the different green investments that we partake in, as well as other activities such as engagements uh, that we also work on. Nonetheless, there are gonna be some things that we need to enhance as far as disclosure and some activities that we need to partake in to further uh, satisfy this SB 964 legislation. <coughs> Uh, some of these activities are going to be including expansion on climate scenarios, carbon pricing, and then also more alignment towards the California climate policy goals. Ultimately, as we do these activities, a significant amount of additional staff time will be required uh, to conduct the research on all of these continuously evolving topics. Outside of this legislation, we're also going to be focusing on what's called the TCFD. Not to throw another acronym at you, but Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Last year, we presented some of the work that Brian and I, as well as the team, have been doing around the TCFD, more from the engagement standpoint on engaging outside corporate companies. But this report going forward will bring it back home. So instead of focusing it more externally, we're going to be focusing a little bit more internally and showcasing how CalSTRS uh, as a large investment portfolio focuses on the TCFD and the different frameworks. The different frameworks have four main categories. One's governance, another one is strategy, uh, another one is risk management, and finally it's metrics and targets. A lot of this is already satisfied in the current report, but there's, once again, certain things that we can do to bridge that gap and really bring it home and make it a little bit more of explicit, uh, explicitly disclosed upon. So, and, and if you look at IND 221, uh, page 17 of uh, the report that talks a little bit more about the TCFD, um, I just wanted also to elaborate in terms of looking forward, um, two points, if you, our unit is, is looking at how we report in general. You know, we do a diversity report and an annual report, and we lead the green team report, and there's a lot of other reporting. So we're looking at how we can be most efficient, how we can address audience needs, and how this report is, is put together is, is probably going to be part of that consideration. And, and the second point is, and, and you'll hear more about this uh, a little bit later today, is we're looking at, I think, our overall strategy around climate change and maybe shifting more towards a, a perspective of, of a transition to a low-carbon economy and how does that mean to, to asset classes and sectors and companies <coughs> and forms of capital. And so I think how that plays out will probably be reflected through this report, which we traditionally use to, to discuss our environmental efforts. So um, with that in mind, we certainly open it to questions and discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thanks, Travis. Let me see if there are committee members. There are. Uh, Sharon. So first of all, I want to thank um, 
you, Harry, and Joy for putting this at the beginning of our sure. meeting today. Because I, I, I will say, I think in the last couple of years, it's, it's sort of been at the end of the day sometimes. And I think, um, I, I think one of the things we're talking about in our cis um, area is really highlighting and telling our story better and getting the story out there with our stakeholders, teachers in the room in California. Um, I think we do our, tell our story globally. I think we have a global reputation, but I think, um, I, so I just applaud you guys for putting this at the beginning because I do think it, it demonstrates that this is a priority for us as a fund to be thinking about these issues. We're, we're talking about them, they're in the newspaper. Um, but I also think there's opportunities for us to, you know, to provide, you know, money for California teachers. So there's opportunities for us in clean energy. And so I appreciate the report. Um, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's, a, it's aesthetically pleasing. And I, if there's one thing I've learned, um, people respond to infographics and things that are easy to see. I, I hate to say it, um, but sometimes people don't read a lot of the, the text, but, but infographics and using that. So I appreciate you guys um, being thoughtful about how we communicate this. And to that point, I, I, I know for me, I've been thinking a lot about there's a lot of organizations out there now talking about ESG and sustainability. Um, there's a lot of different ways of looking at disclosure. And, and I just wonder how your team thinks about, because ultimately what I think about is how do our members and people look at these initiatives that we're doing and see clearly how it's adding value, right? And then how it's mitigating risk. And, um, at least in the, the work I've done the last couple of years, there's just a lot of organizations and a lot of different, there's a lot of distraction, I think. I mean, there's a lot of good work being done, but I wonder, one, is are we getting to a point where there might be a little bit more of a, a uniform way of disclosing uh, information? I don't know if that's true. It just seems like there's, we've got SASB and there's a lot of different organizations and, and is there a way for institutional investors to have a more uniform way of disclosing some of this um, information on ESG? And then two, um, how do we continue to take the information in this report and then provide to our members and the outside world um, really simple metrics around? So ESG is worth all the time and energy we spend on it. It's providing value for our fund at CalSTRS and how is it mitigating risk? And do we have simple ways of communicating that to the outside world? This report's great and I think it's moving in the right direction. Are there ways we're distilling it even more simply? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let Brian and Travis think about question two, and I'm going to tackle question one a little bit. Sharon, you're spot on. So for the new board members, I caution the staff not to throw out too many acronyms, but I'm going to make that mistake already because I wrote an article with a gentleman from England that basically it's alphabet soup out there. So TCFD, uh, SASB, S-A-S-B, uh, GRI, uh, TCFD that runs on and on and on um, of acronyms and you're right I think it is getting too distracting that was a big discussion I had with an investor advisory group how do we consolidate around that mm -hmm. um, and this is my personal view it's not the stirs view so I know people watch so I want to make that clear I really think that people uh, the message we need to send as investors because corporations have uh, survey fatigue. And what we need to really say is, look, TCFD is important because we want you to disclose the risks of your company and think about scope one, scope two, and how are you going to deal with it? As far as a reporting framework, my personal view is we need to push them to start with SASB. That's the basic material information they need to get used to. It's kind of like baby steps, start with that. The ultimate goal is the board Jackson, which is the GRI. But a lot of companies will say, well, we'll do one. Tell us whether you want TCFD, SASB, or GRI. Right. We won't do all of them. And the other big problem we're getting is that we're getting those in sustainability reports, which are public, and that's good. But if we, as investors, we like information to be audited. So we'd prefer it to be in some place in the financial statements and in the quarterly financial statements. That's a real roadblock right now because the general counsels don't want to go there. Um, what we get is a lot of boilerplate, useless information in what I call the MDNA. So sorry, another <coughs> acronym, but the Management Disclosure and Analysis section. 
I'll say it real quick, that think of the financial statements, balance sheet, income statement. Those are all really important. They've been around a long time, a lot of standards about them, but they're usually one day in time or one year, and it's behind us. It's in the rearview mirror. The MDNA is the forward thinking risks of management, and that's where we want them to be better. And Sturz has said this very vocally. We want them to disclose better these forward thinking risks that when we talk to them, they're analyzing these things. They just don't want to be open about it. Some companies are getting better. So I think we as the investor community need to do a better job of prioritizing and helping companies then digest, okay, report this. We pay membership fees to all these organizations. We contribute board time and staff resources to all these organizations. So we've kind of helped create this problem. Um, I've teased uh, uh, Curtis Ravenel and some of the people around Mayor Bloomberg, which is, can he, can he not fund another initiative? Because he funded SASB, he funded DCFD. Let us implement that. And oh, by the way, there are the SDGs, which I haven't begun to talk to you about, Sustainable Development Goals from the UN. So another another taxonomy, another framework. Um, but I think that's an important point when you're hitting on the head, which is we need to focus our efforts and we need to focus our communication because you, you know in life, if you try to tackle too many things at once, no, nothing actually gets done. You might move the needle a little bit, but nothing actually gets accomplished. And this is critical stuff that we need to actually get accomplished. And, and we're one of the global players to, I think, help be able to bring everybody to the table and finally talk it out. So with that, do you guys want to answer question two? So I was going to address your, your second question around providing simple metrics, and I think the easy answer is yes. You, you should be able to. Um, but going back to what Chris said in terms of, of there's so much complexity out there now. We have such a broad audience that we try to speak with. You know, where, Where's that point between you know complex and simple that satisfies everybody? And that's... I don't know, maybe it's sort of a fine tuning, you kind of go one way, but I think we're trying to move in that direction. And we have, as one of the slides pointed out, and I think it's, it's um, around the investments and the metrics, INV 235, and then how we apply those to the different asset classes. I think certainly this is a starting point in terms of these are sort of the important metrics and how they apply to investments. I'm not <clears throat> sure we don't really do that around the, Engagement yet, or we think about it, but I don't know if we've, in, in the sense of reporting, applied it, and maybe we can develop metrics and do that. So I think it's something that can be done. It's something certainly it's a good idea to think about, but again, it's kind of fine tuning work. I think I'm trying to get out that the ESG issue is so controversial. You know, some people think it doesn't, it's not part of our fiduciary duty, or, and so I think having metrics where we say this, this is, you know, I, and examples too. Yeah. 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 I, I, I hear that debate less and less frequently now. Absolutely, People do. are starting to realize yeah. that not taking into consideration environmental, mm -hmm. social, and governance factors is a breach of fiduciary duty. When 10 years ago, it was the opposite. Right. Like, well, that's not your fiduciary responsibility. It seems more common now in conversations that I'm having, people realize it's fully integrated in what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Let me turn it over to uh, Controller Yi. Uh, thank you for the report. Um, I had a couple questions. One, um, in terms of the additional research and reporting on climate scenarios, uh, is the source of those scenarios going to be through some of the engagement activities that are taking place currently? And I know we're lead engager on with many companies, so just wanted to see how what we were planning on incorporating relative to that, and from where. Very short. Um, you're raising an awesome question, which is as we implement the new legislation, we need to have kind of our idea of, of the ramifications of scope one and scope yeah. two. Um, and if for the board members that have been here in the fall, the new board members uh, last October in my evaluation, I told the board that there were two letter C's they had to pay a lot of attention to. And and actually take a position on a forecast into the future, which we normally don't like to do very often. But one was climate and the other was China. Those are things that we have to decide either what we believe in. And, and I think what we're gonna do is, is uh, Controller Yi is tap into some of the money managers we have and some of the scientists, but I think it would help us as a board to kind of come back and have you adopt a, a scope 
or I mean a, a range, because we can't just say here's how the future and scope one emissions are going to play out. We have to come back with a range of we think it could be as severe as this or as light as this, and then analyze our investments and talk to our managers within that. So right now you're seeing some pretty wide variations, but I think using some of the scientists we have access to, particularly in Brian's sustainability portfolio, we have people that are cutting edge thinking about this. It would be great if we could see the outside industry come together and agree, but I think we're going to find you're predicting the future. So you're going to see some pretty wide variations and it will help us to have, I think, an in-house, we don't have to adopt a policy, but an in-house view that you're comfortable with us using. Yeah, good. Good. I look forward to that. Um, very pleased to see the performance of our low carbon index uh, investments. Uh, any plans to invest more assets in that? Yeah. Jim just, uh, I mean, June, that, Jim June, just mentioned Chris, maybe we'll June implement can speak the to it because I think she's implementing. June, are you implementing that? Yeah. Can yeah. Can you speak to it for yeah. us, please? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, June. Because I believe you you you're the person that's implementing the global the equity team manages yes. it. I'm June Kim, the director of global equity. Thanks, we have funded the U.S. and developed markets non-U.S. portion, so the remaining piece is emerging markets. <laughs> And um, we're, we're within our time frame that we had estimated, but that would be an additional investment, yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. And then um, I know we are penetrating the green bond space. Could you talk a little bit about the work with respect to climate bonds? Because um, that's um, an area that's developing and when you expect the standards might be established and what the response of the market Can someone might be? from the fixed income team come up? Sorry. Yeah, um, keep address that. No, don't apologize. It's, <laughs> these are great so questions. I can, yeah. I can kind of address that okay. in the sense that I, I work with Kathy DeSalvo okay. and sit and on the is, yep. Climate Cap Bonds Initiative. The, the, Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> on the uh, uh, Advisory Board of the Climate Bonds Initiative, where this is an organization that's working to set standards around the, sort of the greenness of, of bond issuances yeah. in specific categories like um, transportation and building efficiency. And, and it's, it's, we're slowly rolling out standards and, and I sense that the overall market is growing in terms of sort of our own investment. I think Kathy's better prepared to. I missed the second, or the first part of the question. So I'm Kathy DeSalvo from Fixed Income and I've been the primary buyer of green bonds since 2009. I think at 630, we had 230 million, and now we're back up to about 280 million in green bonds across all sorts of different sectors, utilities, banks, all sorts of different things. Okay. So I missed the first part of the question. Oh, the first part was just um, when you expect the standards to be established. Uh, it's well, timeless. like Brian was saying, for the climate bonds, they yeah. each do a, kind of a sector. So they work on transportation, yeah. different mm -hmm. ones. And so it, it just seems to keep evolving each year to be tighter and tighter, which is a good thing. So they tried to start off with loose parameters, and now they're trying to be more stricter so that they have more meaning versus just greenwashing and that sort of right. thing. Right, right. Yeah. That was a concern early on. Okay, thank you. Anything else, control you? No, thank you, Harry. Thank you. So just be prepared. It's like class. The teacher might be calling on unexpected <laughs> students today. Actually, so be actually, prepared. You know, be channeling. prepared. Harry, Harry, I have one, uh, Harry, I have one more. Cat? One more. Yeah, sure. Actually, just an you. observation. Um, you know, I think this report, um, the elegance of it, I think, is really um, obviously focused on uh, what this fund has done in so many uh, of our, across all of our asset classes, but it really does speak to, um, I think, our role in really part of a larger, you know, kind of global effort uh, moving in this space. So um, I think when we look at the SB 964 uh, report and how much of it is already um, satisfied in this green team report, the additional work that will be done, I think, will uh, really highlight the leadership that CalSTRS is, um, you know, really providing on the, in these other areas. So look forward to that. Thank you. Yeah. Joy. Thank you. Um, so thank you, uh, Brian and Travis and the, and the rest of the team um, for the report. And, uh, you know, Harry actually had the, the great idea to move this to the top of the agenda, which I, um, which I really appreciate because it gave us the airtime we, I think we wanted to talk about this. Um, and I'm also just really looking forward to the agenda item later um, when Kirsty and, and others on the team, Aisha, I think we'll talk about, um, you know, what, we're, what we want to do look going forward to look at, um, look at this more broadly in terms of a transition to a low carbon economy. I think that'll be a great discussion. Um, but looking at the report on, um, <clears throat> let's see, on INV 216 and 217, there were the results of, a, of surveys 
um, with our global equity external managers about how they incorporate climate risk into the investment process and just some other questions to them about how they look at these issues. Um, you know, the, the trend is clearly going in the right direction. I guess I wondered if you could just talk about, um, you know, what our engagement is like with those external managers to continue to, I think, push them toward, um, you know, ideally 100%, um, uh, you know, responding, um, you know, in, the, in, in terms of, um, you know, how they in incorporate climate risk and <coughs> are taking steps to, to better incorporate that into their investment process. Because it looks like we're sort of hovering at the, you know, sort of two-thirds to three-quarters uh, you know, of, of investment or of uh, external managers that are um, including this as part of their decision making. It's certainly a conversation that we have with our uh, managers on a regular basis when we go over the portfolios and it has um, received heightened awareness. It's not, it's nothing new now. It's, it's in ingrained in the conversations. And so it's an ongoing effort. I mean, different companies, given their size and resources, have different um, efforts within <coughs> their firms. But um, it's something everybody's aware of. It's different for different regions around the world. So that's one aspect. Maybe a US small cap manager wouldn't have as many um, topics, per se, to look at versus one of our emerging markets managers where they would really have to scrutinize some of these um, ESG type risks. So I don't have a um, numerical or quantitative answer for you, but um, it's definitely ingrained in the conference um, conversations. The managers are well aware of it and it continues to evolve. ongoing engagement with our external managers and maybe particularly focusing around those um, who are in areas or who are in sectors where we, we think that it is going to be important for them to be accounting for these issues, that that additional engagement is um, sort of getting us to the right place. We do think we're going in the right direction, yes. And and we're not the only clients that are bringing this up. So the more uh, voices they hear from the client side, I think it's getting amplified more and more each year. That's evident to us. OK, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else in the queue? Or, yeah, sure. You're from Alan. Alan Imkin. Uh, Alan Imkin, previously PCA, now Makita. That's the first time I said that. So <laughs> how does it feel? Weird, <laughs> very weird. Um, but it's important to put things in the context of the name of this committee. This is the investment committee. It's not the social policy committee. It's not the do good committee. It's the investment committee. And all of this is in the context of investments. Traditional financial analysis, traditional accounting, traditional research and investments didn't consider these sorts of factors in a focused manner. To one extent or another, all of them, to one extent or another, were part of the decision-making process. But it was never the focus. You, collectively, were first mover. And the whole investment community changed. There is now not a major private equity firm, a major real estate firm, a major asset manager in the world who isn't considering these issues, if for no other reason, every one of the big clients is asking them questions when they do a manager search. So the world has changed, you're in front of the curve, and you should be given credit for it, which is why I'm raising the issue, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. So before we uh, move on to the next item, Brian, Travis, and the rest of the members of the team, thank you for uh, an extraordinary report and the great work to date. Um, in the time that I've been on the board, I've had an opportunity to increase my own knowledge and understanding in this space. Uh, it's certainly not where it was a decade ago, and it, hopefully it's not where it will be in 10 years from now. But I've had the good fortune to sit in on meetings where uh, Kathy has been present at the Milken Institute on green bonds. What are green bonds? What are they not? Where's the industry going? To be able to be in a room like that and hear people talk about what that means um, is quite unique. To be at the new, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance meetings with Brian, with Christopher, 
and others members of the team five years ago, six years ago, when people were talking about the future of transportation, when it's now front page news, people were talking about it at the new uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance Conference. To hear Larry Fink sit and write a paper, his annual report on companies with purpose and why companies need to have purpose and why companies need to take on environmental, social, and governance issues and how there needs to be a common language and matrix used to quantify how ESG really matters. Those are not, you know, low-level players in the capital markets. These are leaders who are talking about this. So I think as a committee, we have a responsibility um, individually and collectively to increase our own level of education about what are we really talking about here, why are we taking time to talk about it, and how does it affect our ability to generate returns. So Joy has raised the point, and, and at our next meeting in May, we'll begin to surface potential um, ideas for a work plan for the next year. We're coming to the end of a two-year work plan where we've talked about the collaborative model, which I think we've educated ourselves on, and we'll be at a point where we will be able to execute. And our consultant said, if executed properly, over time, this collaborative model will have a positive impact on investment returns. So next, in May, I think we might one of the ideas we may surface as a potential work plan issue, a focus for this committee over a one or two year period, is the idea of what does a transition to a low carbon economy mean for an institutional investor? Why is it important? What are the risks and opportunities? What are the policy issues? What does it actually mean so that we as a committee have a level understanding of why we're taking time human resources and dollars and saying this is important to us, to our bottom line. So I just ask that we be open to that concept. And I personally would love to really understand uh, at, a, at a deeper level how these issues are impacting each and every one of the asset classes in a different way. So that looking forward, we're well positioned for this portfolio to form as optimally as possible in a ever-changing global economy, which indisputably is affected by climate risk and the transition to a low-carbon economy. So thanks for the great report. Thanks for the uh, comments and questions of the team. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, Chris, I think this is you. Item three, investment policy revisions. And I know Glenn is out today. So Kathy, is it? Rosie. Okay. Thank you, Harry. Sure. Uh, the first item up is the overall investment policy and management plan. Uh, I wanted to keep the change pretty succinct. You'll see this plan back uh, in July with more wholesale changes. That's our fiscal year start, so it's kind of a, a good time to do the housekeeping. The very beginning, you notice we're crossing out the investment beliefs. Don't worry, we're not getting rid of the investment beliefs. We're just acknowledging they're not a subset of the policy. They're actually a, a just pagination with pagination within the board format. They're the first policy ahead of the investment policy. So what we're asking you to do is to adopt uh, the move to the next step in the asset allocation process for the newer board members. <coughs> When the board in 2015 adopted a new asset allocation policy, uh, basically, you know, it's kind of like we're on one spot on the map and they picked a, a change to a new spot on the map. We plot a course on how we think we'll get there. Um, but I'll use an example of a sailboat. The winds change, the tides move, so it's not a straight line. And we plot a rough course, but we know it's going to change. So it's not a legitimate, you know, we'll just go to step one, two, and three. We also don't do it by the calendar because investments doesn't follow, an, uh, the investment markets don't follow a calendar. We want to do it based on opportunities. So quick summation, uh, we're recommending because private equity and real estate have grown to increase those allocations by 1%. Inflation sensitive, we're making some investments now. Its long-term target is four. We're shooting uh, at this point for three. And all three of those reductions uh, 
would be coming out of the global equity portfolio, which is also one that we're trying to reduce. The question came up from one of the trustees uh, in our briefings. Uh, well, gee, we're right in the middle of an asset allocation study. What if these change in November? We understand that's a risk. We, we anticipate and we think about this, that, which is why these changes really are pretty small, 1% moves, um, because we know these targets may move up or down a little bit between now and November. Uh, but we think this is, in our professional judgment, the, the right step to take. So with that, I'll open any questions. Any questions from the committee? Concerns or, or comments by um, Mika or Alan? I know there's an accompanying letter that Stephen signed off on for the uh, corporate government, uh, the uh, fixed income policy changes. Any comments? No, we support it. Okay. There were no concerns on our end either. Thank you. Um, so, seeing none, th these are action items. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve. So moved. It's been moved and properly seconded to approve the um, policy changes without objection. They're adopted. Thank you. Did you approve all four? I, th I thought we did. Oh, okay. I thought we did. <laughs> yeah. I, this yeah, and I, I communicated with uh, Glenn in advance of the meeting, and he assured me that there were no uh, changes, and uh, these were cosmetic changes to the policy. Yeah, I would just add that uh, one of the board members caught some cosmetic changes, which we will incorporate into okay. those Great. into the fixed income policies. Thank you, Chris. Uh, CIO report. And four. Let me grab. Can you hand that to me, Alan? Yeah. Um, this is the. Uh, Asset mix uh, back in February, we've really been hovering around 225 to 228 billion in assets. You can really see that this last fiscal year, while we've had some variation, uh, it really has been a, a pretty flat year for us. Um, obviously, December being uh, the fall being a tough time in the markets, uh, but then a, a bit of a rally back. And but I always highlight that because there are several teachers in the back of the room that write newsletters and that is an important uh, report for them is the uh, AUM on a regular basis. All right, covered it up. There we go. Here's the asset allocation and this is the old asset allocation. So you'll see that when the ranges and the boxes, global equity will shift down. Um, we're pretty much right on target with the ones you just adopted. Uh, so the variations, the dots from the squares, uh, or the lines help you understand roughly where we are in the mid picture. We've seen some volatility, uh, obviously, in the equity markets. Uh, that has been a, a heck of a challenge. This really shows you the current fiscal year. And I'll go back and pull that graph. It really shows you that we had a nice rally in the summertime, uh, but then we saw, there we go. Uh, then we saw the sell-off in the fall uh, and a very big sell-off in the month of December. December was, as I've said before, one of the worst uh, months of December since the 1930s. So certainly in the last about 75 years, it was the worst December we've ever seen. Then an amazing rally back in, in January and in February. But really since then, the market has basically gone sideways. Uh, and when you step back and look at this on a longer picture, you realize that after the big run-up in the market in 17, 18, and so far 19 have really proven to be pretty choppy. Not a lot of trend, and we'll get into that later in closed session, but, but not a lot of solid trends, just a lot of short-term choppy waves, and that makes it tough on us and everybody. Here's the non-US market. So you can see that that actually is a bit lower than where it started at the beginning of our fiscal year. Again, a very choppy market. It also had a very bad October, November, December. Uh, rallied back a bit in January and February, but not as much as the USA because the problems overweighing the rest of the world markets, no, no question, Brexit. Uh, if you didn't note, they, they disapproved all eight options uh, last night. So uh, I was uh, spending a lot of time last week really trying to understand that better. And the best quote I can give you was, from one of June's uh, global equity managers who said, 
uh, his answer to, to Brexit was, it's clear as mud. Um, and the thing that shocked me, frankly, was the number of construction cranes you can still see around the city of London and the reaction of our currency managers, some of our other sustainable managers, <clears throat> was uh, pretty calm. And it's the view that the outcome will be reasonable. And they're aware of the extreme two ends of, of the risk, but they're just comfortable that it, it's got to be a reasonable outcome. And I, I told them, boy, watching it from over here sure doesn't feel that way. What it feels like over here is, you know, a two-decker bus uh, heading to a cliff at about 90 miles an hour. Everybody is screaming and yelling, and no one's grabbing the wheel or hitting the brake. And because they're comfortable that either that cliff will be extended by the EU or somebody will finally step up and, and take action. But uh, here we are now. They have two deadlines, April 12th or in May. And if they don't take any action by early next week, their deadline is going to be April 12th, and it will be a hard Brexit. So... Uh, there is there's definitely a, a completely different attitude and atmosphere in the UK than you see in the EU being Germany and France uh, and, and the whole block. So that really overhangs this non-US market. Uh, Japan's economy is not terribly strong still for the fourth decade. So that really is holding back non-US stocks in a lot of ways. This is one of the times I really wish uh, I could have a whiteboard. The staff knows I, I always like to go to the whiteboards, and it would be a real good teachable moment, particularly for the teacher members in the back of the room. Uh, so here it's hard because I, I can't go up and grab it very well. But this is the yield curve. So from the uh, <clears throat> first part of the chart is short-term interest rates. Think of Treasury bills, and in this case, one-year T bills issued by the U.S. government. You go out to about 10 years, and then the farthest maturity is 30 years out. And keep in mind, the USA is the only country that really has a 30-year bond market. Most other countries, the longest maturity is 10. What we pay attention to is the slope of that line. Is it positively sloped or negatively sloped? And you're hearing a lot about an inverted yield curve. The pink line is, is where it was at the end of February. And I, we doesn't work with a highlighter in here, but if, if you look at that 10-year maturity mark, kind of the two-thirds out on that curve, that's where the yield dropped and the short end was up, barely inverted. It, at this distance to the board, it would look still flat, but that's what Wall Street got so excited about last Friday was it went inverted for the first time. Why does that matter? Why do we care? First off, when we say inverted, our in-house view, the whole curve is inverted. Short-term maturities have a higher yield than long-term maturities. So for you guys, it, it would look like this, a short-term maturity and a long-term maturity. Really, the curve is actually very flat. But why does it matter? Uh, Dave Wilson of Bloomberg put out a great piece. He does a chart of the day. We all, A lot of us subscribe to it. That when you look back at history, and let me grab it so I make sure I get the stats right. When you look back at history, three months after the yield curve goes inverted, stock market's usually up a little bit, even six months after it's up. But 12 months after, the stock market's completely flat. And this is back to 1966. 18 months later, the stock market is down on average about 7%. That's why Wall Street cares so much, is that when the curve goes inverted, um, then they're worried that in the next 18 months, we're going to have somewhere uh, a recession or a negative market. It's the old question of, of causality or just that there happens to be a, a connection. And it just happens to be a connection. But I've said to in the media, and I've said to you several times, we need to not look as much at the stock market. We need to take our clues from the bond market. Because bond investors, I think, have a better sense of where the economy is going and where things are heading. And so this is serious. The fact that it's giving us a, a mixed message at this point, a cautionary message over the next 18 months uh, for, for US stocks in particular. 
I just thought I added this right before, so I'm not sure if it's in the, the online version. I think they're going to update the online version of the PowerPoint for people. But I added this slide because I thought it would be useful to just point out. This, the column on the left side is 10-year is interest rates. So 10-year bonds, government bonds issued by each of these countries. The USA is about 2.4% when I did this. UK, less than 1%. Germany, the yield is negative. So if you buy a 10-year German bond, you have to pay them during the life of that holding. What you're saying is, I don't want to return on my money. I want a return of my money. Um, obviously, the idea of a mayonnaise jar in the backyard comes to mind, but maybe you're not going to be able to find it in 10 years. Um, and then obviously France, but then look at Japan. Uh, and they have been negative on and off for uh, several, several, uh, almost a decade. And I put on there in the end, just to give it some perspective, Greece, who has threatened to go bankrupt several times and been kicked out of the EU, not that much higher than the USA. So if you're a non-US investor, you want to buy the USA. The problem is a non-US investor has to worry about currency conversion. And that's where they're cautious, and that's why they don't flood to the USA. But... Yeah. Our yields are higher, even though they are very, very low. And then the, on the side, you can see the trend line with uh, German bonds. Uh, the Bund, which is the 10-year German bond, is in the black. And uh, the Japanese uh, bond is in the blue. So you can see where their interest rates have been over time. Very remarkable. Uh, none of the textbooks any of us took in college and in our masters would ever tell us that interest rates can go negative. So uh, when we say a historic time, it truly is breaking uh, thought process. I showed this chart uh, about uh, six months ago to the investment committee, and I thought it'd be worthwhile to bring it back since we have so many trade discretions. I thought it was a very clever chart showing you where trade goes and, and what's important to the USA and what's important to the world. So obviously, you've got the various country flags out there. The size of the arrow shows you the volume of trade. And then obviously, the, the green is um, uh, heading out, and the blue is, uh, or pardon me, the blue is heading into the USA, and the green is where we're trading things out. So, our major export markets are NAFTA, first and foremost. But I always thought it's important to point out China is number three to us. It is important. But in the middle of that chart, I know it's busy. Look at the size of the blue arrow coming into the USA from China and the small size of the green arrow going out. So that's why there's been such a discussion about trade and why it's been so important. Some of the other arrows are fairly balanced in size of what goes out and what comes in. In our top imports, where do we bring things in from? By far, China, number one. But again, I'll point out NAFTA. Um, so that is a very important relationship all the time is Mexico and Canada because naturally there's, it's easier to transport stuff across the land. But I think trade and trade issues are certainly going to be heavy on global investors' minds and particularly U.S. investors' minds for the coming year or more. So uh, once every board meeting, I kind of climb up the crow's nest, look out on the horizon, uh, in terms of global risk to monitor, they haven't changed a lot. I highlighted the trade war issues, uh, Brexit. It was brought up today uh, by uh, Larry Kudlow in his speech that the negotiation with China has no timeline. It's an open-ended still. It's more about getting it right than a certain timeline, So that, but that's going to weigh over everybody's head. Um, there are positives. You know, the U.S. economy is growing, but it's very slow. And I think the, the combination of those two slides of the chart is what's overhanging the markets and causing them to be fickle and really trendless in a lot of cases. Obviously, the Federal Reserve is a big focus. Every statement Jay Powell makes is absolutely moving the market. And I think we're seeing that jitteriness of a new Fed and trying to get used to what they're doing, how to tighten, when to loosen. Uh, and how to manage. So we're seeing quite a lot of volatility about their statements. Inevitable surprises, again, these are surprises. These are things that are probably inevitable in our, in our lifetime, but will still be a surprise when they happen. I only raise them just so you're aware there are always outside risks. Uh, and I think it's fascinating that we basically have already started the 2020 election uh, with a debate this week. Um, uh, so 
that will dominate headlines. I don't know that it's going to weigh on investors' minds much until we get into that cycle. It really is more people have angst about what different people say they will propose. Uh, but hopefully, you know, that's a one-day, two-day reaction, and then we go back to thinking about what's the economy doing. Lastly, I want to point out for certainly the members in the room, but always uh, people have lots of questions about the investment portfolio. The calsters.com website is excellent. There's a tab on investments. You have all these different categories, including videos, including the green report, uh, and even a video glossary that, again, a shout out to communications that we have continued to put together. If any board member comes across a word that you're like, hey, this would be better, uh, we're we're finally actually starting to get a little penetration with some of the teachers that are using this as, hey, this is a good way to kind of teach a little bit of financial literacy um, because they're snappy, they're short, and it's nice to hear somebody explain to you what does EFA mean. Uh, and I'll actually credit Sharon Hendricks sort of for the idea behind this because it came out of uh, the movie The Big Short mm -hmm. where they use little vignettes from celebrities to describe credit default swaps and, uh, and convertible mortgages. So we're trying to do that uh, with our staff, and it's a nice opportunity. With that, I'm open to questions. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Any questions? Okay. See, seeing none. Um, I would just bring to the attention of my colleagues INV 171 tables four and five. Uh, just bring those to your attention because of the significance of those uh, relationships and how meaningful they are to both those asset classes. Those are big asset classes, but those relationships uh, really are critical. And I just think it's important that people have that in context. Okay, so uh, with that, why don't we take a 10-minute break? We'll come back at 10.20. <laughs>